Happy Friday, and welcome again to the United States Marshals Museum live, well, maybe not live, but from the banks of the Arkansas River in Fort Smith, Arkansas. I just wanted to let you know today is going to be kind of a little bit different just because there's a little weather event that's been going on here in the Fort Smith area on Thursday and Friday, the week that this is supposed to be airing live. And so what I wanted to make sure we got done was that we have everything all queued up ready to go and out on youtube so you guys can enjoy it this week as you can imagine february as with every year we are celebrating black history month and we like to talk a lot about the history of the united states marshals and during february we like to talk about the black u.s marshals in our history and while a lot of times in the past uh, we typically tend to talk about bass reeves and some of the folks bass worked with if you jump over to our facebook page you'll be able to see a lot of different things that we've talked about in the past during our Facebook Lives that we've done on Facebook. And we'll be sharing those links out. So make sure you follow us here, you follow us there, you'll figure out what's going on. So today though, for a special, we're going to air excerpts from an interview I did a few years back with Bobby Banks. Bobby Banks is one of my favorite people. He's an amazing guy. He was a career deputy United States Marshal, started out uh, as a kid, he went into the United States Marine Corps, served in Vietnam as a combat veteran there, comes back, serves as a member of the Washington, D.C. police force. After a few years of that, decides he's going to become a deputy U.S. marshal. And during his time as a deputy U.S. marshal, it was in from 71 to 99, and he did about every job that you can think of in the United States Marshal Service. U.S. District Court, U.S. Superior Court in D.C., uh, he worked at headquarters, uh, was part of special operations group, worked in internal affairs, worked in witness security, uh, threat analysis. And he also, when he retired, he was in the Office of International Affairs within Enforcement Division. So really, just like a ton of different things. He, early in his career, he was escorting the mysterious cassette, the, the tape from, I guess it wasn't a cassette, the reel-to-reel -reel tape from Watergate. Uh, with the missing, uh, what was it, 15, 17 minutes, something like that. Uh, but really one of the key parts of his story that really kind of stands out for me is his story escorting James Earl Ray. He'll be talking about that, his association with the history of Martin Luther King, with his history within the Marshal Service, being a black man at a very difficult time in the Marshal Service and being one of a very small number of trendsetters and really just some amazing stories. So I hope you enjoy hearing from Bobby as much as I did when I got to sit down and listen to him about five years ago. So with that, please sit back, listen. If you've got a question about this, if this is during, during the regular live time, I'm going to be sitting and watching this at home, hopefully with the power. And so I'll be able to comment back and forth. Otherwise, if you're watching this down through the years, go ahead and ask your questions and somebody from the Marshalls Museum will get back to you. Thanks a lot. Make sure you stop by the web page. Make sure you stop by our Facebook page. And uh, we'll talk to you more about the Marshall Service. Thanks a lot, and I hope you have a great time. Again, I mentioned to the fact that I came on in 1971. Uh, prior to 1971, I served as a police officer in Washington, D.C. I was there for uh, uh, for three years. Uh, prior to that three years, I was with the United States Marine Corps, and I served as a combat veteran in Vietnam. So I'm a Vietnam veteran um, uh, that served honorably in the United States Marine Corps. Um, saw quite a bit of action in Vietnam. Um, came back and uh, was a basket case for about a year, and then. My wife, who I've been married to for 50 years, uh, 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 stuck, pushed me, pushed me forward, and said, "Let's get up, and let's get going." And so that's when I joined the police department, Washington D.C. After three years, uh, I uh, I joined the uh, uh, 1960, 1971. I was on the police department 68 to to 71. I was. Uh, on the police department when the assassination of Martin Luther King occurred and that was significant to me because it was um, it, ha it occurred on my birthday April 4th uh, and um, and so I went back to work and didn't see my family for about a month or so 
pretty much. Uh, then in 71, I went to the Marshal Service was, uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, didn't know a lot about the Marshal Service at the time, other than the fact that I would see these guys that uh, uh, were dressed up in suits and they didn't work shift work. <laughs> so, uh, didn't know that when I joined the Marshal Service that uh, uh, we work around the clock, basically. But at any rate, uh, when I came to the Marshal Service, I started in Superior Court and then later went to district court, then I went to the United States Marshal Service headquarters. Uh, again, I was in uh, uh, my first uh, major assignment at the headquarters level, or before got, getting to headquarters, was with Special Operations Division. Uh, that was one of the uh, premier organizations in the Marshal Service, and I, I uh, uh, served as a, uh, an inspector there uh, and worked with a lot of luminaries and high-profile folk there. Uh, and I uh, worked there on a lot of high-profile assignments, as I said before, escorting uh, uh, James Earl Ray and the Slice Select Committee. And then after that, I went into internal affairs. Uh, a lot, I lost a lot of buddies there because I was not welcome in a, in a lot of respects once you joined that organization. I was drafted into that, if you will. Uh, I say drafted by uh, one of the assistant directors who thought that uh, I would be an asset to him. Difficult assignment, I served there as an investigator and then later uh, left and then came back as a, as a supervisor. Uh, so I worked in internal affairs and then from there the threat analysis division. That was uh, a separate entity in the Marshal Service uh, that supported uh, the core security division. Uh, uh, Again, I, before they had the Witness Security di uh, Division, uh, I did a lot of WITSEC work, um, uh, core security work. Uh, we were generalists, for, so to speak, early in the day. Uh, uh, I guess the, uh, one of the things I'm most proud of is my association with the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children. Uh, when I was in the Enforcement Division, uh, Officer in International Affairs, before I got there, uh, I was introduced to Office of International Affairs along with uh, uh, Jay Fry, who is a uh, fellow deputy and dear friend. And I've always had a strong um, feeling for children, even as a police officer, I always felt that they need to be protected. They are the unprotected and they should, uh, we, I understood there were a lot of predators out there from my, my experience as a police officer, but I always uh, uh, had a, a very, uh, soft spot in my heart for, for, for children. Uh, and when I was exposed to them at an early age, uh, that, that is the National Center of Missing Exploited Children, um, I knew a couple of police officers and found out the work that they were doing there. I, I began to learn more and more about it. And so my association with them was, uh, was uh, uh, tenuous, but uh, I, was, I saw a lot of ways that I thought the Marshal Service could help in that area. And, and, I, and I brought that forward to a lot of folk. Uh, and and uh, so Jay and I both did that. And so I was proud of the fact that um, uh, later on I was uh, asked to join as a, uh, uh, the, the, the National Mission Support of Children. And uh, they had the pro what they had uh, a program called Project Alert, which was a uh, America's Law Enforcement Retirement Team. And uh, so we had a vetting committee. We were a group of vetters that looked at the homicide, retired homicide detectives and to look at old cold case files. And so I was part of that. Um, I recently retired from, um, uh, in my retirement, recently retired from the National Center uh, because I felt that I wasn't able to give all that I could. And uh, quite frankly, uh, technology had passed me by. And a lot of times it had to do with the computers and making presentations and so on and the like. But as I mentioned before, uh, Martin Luther King was uh, assassinated on April 4th, 1968. The irony of all this is that I was born on April 4th, 1940, uh, I won't go, <laughs> 43. I, uh, um, so then uh, during, during the riots after that, you know, there was, uh, there was a lot of upheaval in the District of Columbia burning the light. 
and I was a young police officer at the time. And um, so later on in life, then I never would have dreamed that uh, I was a police officer back then in 68, that I get into the marshal service and then they had this uh, assignment for this for the man who killed a a, a uh, idol of mine, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, who uh, when he made this famous uh, I have a dream speech, I was there as a young African American black who experienced a lot of unevenness in this country. Uh, and so to have the man who actually killed him and for me to, to be asked to be on the team to protect him uh, was a challenge. It was a challenge from the standpoint of how would I interact with this guy. You see it was four of us uh, that had his personal security. It was the SAW commander, um, myself, Floyd Johnson, and forgive me, I should not forget who the fourth. And we would, uh, when he would come in, when they bring him in to, uh, on a helicopter, we would pick him up, surround him, and make sure nothing uh, occurred to him. And I was willing to die if anybody who came against him. In other words, my duty was to protect uh, and, and make sure that he was safe and secure. And so uh, the the uh, the week or so, I believe it was, when he testified, I was there. I was a guy, of course, I was much thinner then, in much better shape, had a big bush. <laughs> and the like. I saw a man who uh, uh, was very, very stoic. Uh, he, uh, I thought he was very, very tough. I, you know, if you if you had to deal with this guy, and I was a Marine, uh, you know, he was he was committed to what he was, what he thought, and what he felt. And of course, I was committed as well. So, uh, but I didn't like him. But Notwithstanding that, my job was to protect. It, it, the irony of it was that uh, every day while he was, while we were in D.C., uh, his uh, his attorney, counselor, uh, you know, we had to provide lunch for him, and he made it a point to point to me and said, "I want that uh, deputy marshal there to make sure that he goes out and get the get his lunch for him." <laughs> and so, I, I and so. Why me? I mean, if anybody, and I did, and I made sure that nothing, you know, his food was was pristine, that it was the best in the whole nine yards. But uh, I thought I was challenged in a lot of ways about how I was I would uh, interact with him, and so it's it's something that uh, that stayed with me for a long time, and it still t it stays with me that I would defend uh, a person who I detested. Uh, who killed an idol uh, in my mind, I say, who did, because uh, there's some question about whether or not he in fact was, the, was the, uh, the assassin. I think when I understood the evidence, it was clear to me. So, but at any rate, uh, yeah, it was difficult for me from African American standpoint to, to be on that assignment. But I was honored to have been uh, chosen for that position by the Marshal Service, yes. During that era, of course, we did a lot. Of, uh, like I said, I was in a threat assessment. But uh, when we had the uh, Gordon Call uh, incident, and uh, and uh, you know, we lost some deputy marshals during those assignments, and uh, uh, that was, uh, I realized that uh, this country, uh, aspects of this country, they had folk who uh, had persuasion that uh, they just wanted to follow. Uh, and that was against African American thoughts and, 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 and the like. And so that, that, that was significant uh, to me. And I, of course, you know, today it, it, it begs my understanding about why, we, why that is the case. I guess I'm uh, vacillating here a little bit because I want to get to uh, one point on that. Uh, but yes, uh, it was a period where, uh, uh, you know, I'd had some interactions with that. Um, and I was in the special operation at the uh, special operation group at the time, and a lot of times we were engaged in in a lot of assignments dealing with the white supremacists and and and, uh, and the different uh, assignments that we had when we interacted with them. Um, I recall two things uh, when I was a police police officer. I never forget this. 
uh, the Ku Klux Klan had uh, petitioned to have a a a, a, a march on uh, down Constitution Avenue, and uh, I think I was with the police department or the marshal. I'm not quite sure. I think it was with the police department, and my again that assignment was for me to be uh, to walk side to protect that right for them to march and demonstrate. And that is important in this country to understand that everybody has the right to protest according to the law. And so I've always felt very, very strongly about that. In accordance with the law, you know, we have a right to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. And so I've always been about duty first. And I think that's important. And, and, and what the law says and what my responsibilities are as a man, number one. Uh, so, uh, what my personal views are about certain organizations will always stand, but but what my job and, and responsibilities are is as another aspect that I would follow through, and whatever it takes, I would I would uh, make sure that I do my my most to make sure that the rights are, uh, of others are protected. Later on, I had a dear friend. Uh, I won't call his name. Uh, he was a deputy marshal retired, and he um, uh, for so many years. And so he, when uh, one day he called me, and said, "Bob Banks, I want to, I want to show you something." And uh, I said, "Okay." And so I went to his residence, and he had a a plastic bag. And in the plastic bag, uh, he had a full, uh, authentic uh, Grand Wizard uh, suit uh, from the Ku Klux Klan member, a Ku Klux Klan member. And I looked at him, and we we're very close. He's Canadian born. He served in the Marine Corps, so I loved him dearly. He's a, my brother, uh, and so, but I was I was taken back and I was angered by that, and I said, "Why would you show me this?" And and you want me, and he was going to present it to me, and why would you think I would want that? And he said, he went on to say, he said, "Well, why not? Why not you?" And I and I failed to 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 grasp that, and. Uh, uh, I thanked him, but I was angry with him. I said, and I and I left. Uh, he said, "Well, when you leave, I want you to think about it. I want you to think about. It. I'm gonna hold this here, and I want you to think about it." And uh, of course, he showed me that that initial meeting. He showed me the uh, the gentleman who wore this uh, uh, the wore this clan outfit. Uh, it must have been about a month. And he called me up. He said, "You still angry with me?" I said, "No, but I'm." I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm just uneven about all of this. And he said, I still want you to have this. And I still question him why. And he went on to say, he said, well, do you know who uh, are the biggest um, collectors of Nazi uh, German uh, artifacts are? I said, I have not a clue. He says, the Jews. I said, you kidding me? He said, no. He said, they have more artifacts from their persecutors than, than anybody. And he said, so why not? So it's under that, it was because of that, I decided to receive that package. He said, I will do one thing. I'm going to take the information inside who it belongs to away from you. I said, that's fair enough. And, I, and he did. I regret that he did that. Now I wish I had it because I would make that presentation. But he did that, and today, that item still is in my possession. And so, uh, as time has gone on, I think it's no more fitting. And I thought about it when they opened up the uh, uh, African American Museum, whether or not that would be something that I would donate to them. But then I recall that I mentioned to it to um, uh, the uh, a former curator, curators of the museum uh, uh, because the marshals has played a, a significant role 
as far as uh, on both sides really as a matter of fact they the marshal service uh, uh, they used deputy marshals uh, uh, during uh, during the time was was when uh, African Americans escaped blacks escaped from res uh, from uh, uh, from the slave masters uh, the marshals were sent out to to track them down uh, uh, the marshal service also um, protected and so I'm trying to figure out who best to would best serve, but at any rate, I am prepared to uh, relinquish that item. Uh, so, yeah. Well, uh, like I said, I had not a full grasp of what the Marshal Service did at the time when I came on. Uh, there was a transition. There was no doubt about that. Uh, matter of fact, there were not many black mar deputy marshals in that area. Uh, it was during, uh, I believe it was during uh, Kennedy's time that uh, there was an, uh, a call, if you will, for uh, to uh, have more representation from the African American community. And so it was during that time that, uh, that I, I uh, heard about the Marshal Service and, um, and, and elected to, to look into it and then decided to join. Uh, I can tell you that it wasn't easy. In other words, uh, a lot of times uh, uh, we were not well received. Uh, and, and by that I mean, and uh, you know, there were certain things we could do in the courthouse that we could, that, uh, uh, and we couldn't do. You know, we, we, we were there but we couldn't be seen, if you will. And, uh, and I'm reminded that there was a judge that I, who later became a member of the bench in the federal court talked about that era and that time and what she went through. I didn't know about that. But yeah, there was a time where there was difficulties and there was, uh, and those difficulties were bored out by, uh, by complaints and, 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 uh, and the like. And uh, I know that I, I played a part as far as bringing those issues to light. Um, I talked about the unevenness in the Marshal Service and at the time uh, I was penalized for it. Uh, and I won't go into that, but, uh, but I always believe that if you committed to your convictions and if you stand on right, then eventually things will, will sort its way through. And so, uh, so I fought in, in, in within the system to, to try to make things even and try to make it right. And that's what I live by. And so uh, eventually things came a bit better, a bit better, a bit better. Uh, uh, by no means was it completely, I'm not going to lie about that. Uh, there were a lot of things that uh, I felt that uh, I thought that uh, I could, if I was treated fairly, more fairly, if you will, uh, I could have done much more, but I did well. So I don't want to get into too much about that, but I'm just proud of the organization and how it's moved forward. And now we have uh, black U.S. Marshals and, and chief deputies and, and the like. And so, uh, of all law enforcement communities I know of, uh, I don't think anybody has done it better than the Marshal Service. And then, and then when you look back on history, and you look back at what Bash Reeves did, and 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 and, and so, you know, they the Marshal Service has always been progressing, man. They always kept on going, uh, striving to to to, go, to move forward. And like a lot of entities, that didn't. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, are we are we perfect? No. But uh, uh, we try to do the right thing, and so I think that's important. I think it bore. I think the spirit of March service. Uh, I think it's, it's it's rooted. I guess in the first judicial act of seventeen eighty nine, uh, when uh, when uh, we were tasked with the. Uh, what, what our responsibilities were, and that was to, of course, to support uh, the, the court system. And I think from, stem from stemming from that, uh, there is a relationship with the courts about the law and about, and about how uh, this country, which is based on laws, but how we have been able to carry on that very important piece, man, of, 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 of the law. And I think that the connect tissue of all of that is we're willing to do whatever it takes to make sure that that piece, that, 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 that thread 
uh, that was first brought out early on continues on, and that's the the, the support, uh, uh, the 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 the, 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 uh, the court's order, which is so important to our society, and to and to do it faithfully, and uh, and 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 to uh, and to do it at all costs, and and that's evident by the 200 or so or 300 uh, dead souls we have in Oklahoma back in the territory, even up until today, where deputy marshals are killed in the line of duty, executing those court orders, man. So you have that piece back then coming right up to the day that uh, we're willing to die to make sure that uh, justice that we follow that the laws are executed in a fair and impartial manner so I think that is um, and we find people that are willing to do that I think that's key I think that's key yeah You know, when I I I did, 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 did I was surprised, and I had to I got to say this. I was I was I was very surprised to see uh, African American uh, uh, U.S. marshal here in the state. To be honest with you, and so I, I when I talked to Louis McKinney, I said, uh, "So where's the marshal?" And he looked and he pointed me over there, and I said, "He's the marshal," and a big smile came on my face. <laughs> you know, because I'm going back in time in history. You see. Well, that wasn't the case at all, and it's so proud for me to look over and see someone like uh, with my skin color that's accepted and who works and see there again, you know, if we can just put aside our dumb differences and, and accept for who and what we are and the fiber of the inside of a person because I see the connection between he and the chief of police and the sheriff and they have a commonality with and they work together. So, but uh, I got to say, I, I, I was very happy, and I, I made it my point to introduce myself to the marshal. I told him how glad it was to see him, and how glad it was to meet him. And he was, uh, he was uh, looking forward to when he becomes a, uh, I think he's a, a member of the association, and how he said that, uh, unlike any other law enforcement component, this marshal service association is unlike any others, and that is, uh, we seem to love one another, whatever our differences are. And Lord knows we have our differences, so, but there's a love for one another. And so, yeah, that's, that's key, that's important. Right. Yeah.